Hebrews. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Where are we going to? Hebrews chapter 9. For the past few months, we have been looking at the principles, the messages from the sanctuary. Amen? Amen. Because Christ has told us his way is in the sanctuary. And those who plan to be saved, and those who plan to be a part of the 144,000, the Bible says that they must follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. That tells me there is a way in which Christ is leading. There's a what, my friends? There is a way in which Christ is leading. And that way, we don't have to guess at it, that way is in the sanctuary. For Psalm 77 verse 13 says, Thy way, O Lord, thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? But my friends, I want to tell you something. It's a different thing than just knowing what the sanctuary is. It's a different thing than just knowing what the articles are, the furniture are in the sanctuary, than for someone to actually experience what these things mean. We cannot be people who just have an intellectual knowledge, but lacking a spiritual experience. But if we hunger after righteousness, Matthew chapter 5 tells us that we shall be what? We shall be filled. In Hebrews chapter 9, how many of us remember what we looked at on last Sabbath when we met? How many remembers? How many? All right, what did we look at? We looked at the golden censer. In Hebrews chapter 9, as Paul and friends, we have gone through the outer court, and we're not finished with the outer court. We have gone into the holy place. We're not finished yet. We're now into the most holy place. And last week we saw in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse 3 and verse 4, that the apostle Paul mentioned these items, furniture in the sanctuary in a specific order because that is the way in which the Spirit of God led him. And if the Spirit of God led him to look at these items in a consecutive order, a sequential order, which order should we study the sanctuary items? In the same order. And in verse 3, the Bible says, verse 3, the Bible says, And after the second veil, that's the most holy place now, the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the what, my friends? The holiest of all, which had, what's the first item? which had the golden censer. We looked at that last week. The golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. So what is the second furniture item listed by Paul? It is the what, my friends? It is the Ark of the Covenant. And what is our topic for today? Look at the screen. What, my friends? Look, look at your sermon notes. It is the Ark of the Covenant. And as I began to study into the Ark of the Covenant, I, I, I approach the Ark of the Covenant in a way in which I've never approached it before. I looked at the Ark of the Covenant and I said, Lord, help me to study this Ark as if I had never heard anything about the Ark of the Covenant. And guess which book I picked up? With my Bible. I picked up the Strong's Bible Concordance. Why? I wanted to see all the scriptures that mentioned Ark. Because I want to dig into the Ark of the Covenant. And beloved, I was shocked when I saw this, what I'm going to share with you. Surprise! Thrilled! That word Ark, I looked up in the Strong's Concordance. And because I'm in Hebrews, I went to the, to the New Testament. If you go into your Strong's Concordance, it gives you a specific number by the word Ark and all the various scriptures uh, that mention Ark. Is that clear, my friends? And then that number, if you take that number and go into the back, by the dictionary, it gives you the actual meaning of the word Ark. Now, since we're in Hebrews, that's New Testament, so I went over into the Greek. New Testament, Hebrew, Old Testament, New Testament, Greek. And the Bible and the concordance tell us that this word art means a sacred box. A what, my friends? A sacred box. And then the concordance says, uh, just as Noah's ark. Now, 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 that didn't shake you up as it did me. 
we are, I was looking at the Ark of the Covenant, and the root word for Ark in the Greek brings, brought me back to the Ark of Noah. What God has been showing us, friends, that if we study deeply the Ark that Noah built, we can understand more clearly and even more practically the Ark of the Covenant. Go to Genesis chapter 6 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Genesis chapter 6. And let's take a look at the condition of the earth, the condition of the world. In the days of Noah, just before God told Noah to build the ark. Bible puts it this way in Genesis chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Are we there, my friends? The Bible says that in the days of Noah, there was a great increase in the population growth. Verse 1 says, and friends, no word is written there by happenstance or accident. Notice in verse 1, are we there? The Bible says, and it came to pass when men began to what? Multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Pause right there, friends. I said, Lord, what does the word multiply mean? For as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days. And I want to know if I'm truly living in the last days, just before Christ makes his second appearing. That word multiply in the Hebrew dictionary means, my friends, a large increase, a, 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 a drastic increase of the population size. Listen, friends, as it was in whose days? Noah's day, so shall it be when in the last days. So friends, I went to the encyclopedia. I went to the internet and I began to do my search, my friends. And this tells me that between the years of 1901 to 2000, over 6 billion, how many, my friends? Six over 6 billion people were added to the world. And how many people are living in the world today? Approximately 7 billion. Look at this here, my friend. Look at the screen. It says here, it says, during the 20th century alone, the population in the world has grown from 1.65 billion, how many, my friends? Uh, 6 billion. And they are projecting that more. It's going to increase. Are we living in the days of Noah? Are we living in the last days, my friends? Go down to verse 2 with me. Listen to what it says now, friends. That the sons of God, are we there? That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose in the days of Noah. Unequally yoked marriages were very much prevalent in the days of Noah. Is unequally yoked marriages uh, prevalent today within the church? What is unequally yoked marriages, my friends? This is when a professed believer of God, a professed believer of God, one who believes in the end time truth from the Bible, goes out there. And marry somebody who does not believe the truth. Take your sermon notes. And when they are stubborn, rebellious, they must have their own will. And they marry someone outside the faith. This is unequal to your marriages, my friends. And these things are prevalent today. And the one who thinks he's strong or she's strong and goes out there and marries someone not in the faith, don't even know that they will be pulled down spiritually. It's either that loved one becomes converted or you become more like a heathen. That's why Christ warns us of being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 through verse 17. And ask some, in the, ask some people, my friends, who profess Seventh-day Adventism, when they went out to intermarry those not of the faith of Seventh-day Adventism, their marriage relationship, instead of getting better, it got worse. And their spiritual lives got also worse in the process. 
And what about their children? Notice here, my friends, on line number 6B, pardon me, line number 7B, it says, are we there, my friends? It says, this association was productive of the worst results. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. The children of whom, saith God's professed people back there, attracted by the beauty of the daughters of Cain's descendants, displeased the Lord by what, my friends, intermarrying with them. And what's happening today, my friends? What's happening? And yet people are asking, are we living in the last days? Just look at your marriage. Look at your relationship. You are fulfilling one of the primary signs that we're living in the days of Noah. Notice here, my friends, as we go on to read, it says, Many of the worshippers of God were beguiled into sin by the allurements, the allurements that were now constantly before them. And they were, talk to me, friends, together. And they lost their peculiar holy character pause right there so this intermarrying wasn't wasn't only as it relates to marriages physical marriage but also worship when god's professed people adopted the worship styles and patterns of the world and brought those things within their home within their churches it displeased god and yet people, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, are asking, are we living in the last days? Amen. Look at your church. Look at, the, look at the style of worship in your church. Those styles and patterns came from the world. Amen. Look at how you worship in your home. Some of you don't even have a family altar in your home. Don't even have devotion. And you are asking, are we living in the last days? Don't be self-deceived, my friends. It goes on to say, listen here, it says, from the book Petros and Prophets, page 81, paragraph 2, it says, mingled with the depraved. God's people, they became like them in spirit and in deeds. The restrictions of which commandment, the seventh commandment were disregarded. And they, God's people, took them wives of all which they chose. And what is a woman a symbol of in the Bible prophecy? Church, reading on. The children of Seth, God's professed people, went in whose way? Went in the way of Cain. They fixed their minds upon a worldly prosperity and enjoyment and neglected the commandments of the Lord. Pause, dear friends. And some of us are asking, do you mean we shouldn't have enjoyments? Beloved, if the pleasures and the enjoyments you are having come at the expense of your spiritual growth, that is not Bible enjoyment. Amen. That's not Bible pleasure, my friends. Check yourself. It says as we read on, men, and who are these men? These are God's professed people. Men did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Who are these men? Not the world. Because the world is the world. But men did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They became vain where? In their imaginations, their minds. And their foolish heart, their foolish mind was what, my friends, darkened. Therefore, God gave them over to a mind void of judgment. Sin spread abroad in the earth like a what, my friends? Like a deadly leprosy. Are we living in the days of Noah, my friends? Notice verse 4 of Genesis chapter 6 here. How was it back then? Beloved, if you're sleeping, please wake up. Don't you miss verse 4 and these points. Verse 4 says, there were giants in the earth. Underscore that word giants. There were giants in the earth in, in, in those days, in Noah's days. And also after that, when the sons of God, God's professed people, came in unto whom? 
the world, the daughters of men, that they bear children to them, and the same, the same children of God's professed people became what, my friends? Became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Pause right there. Remember, my friends, I approach this as if I never read Genesis 6 before. What does the word giant mean? There were giants in Noah's day. And the Bible says, my friends, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days, my friends. I went to the, talk to me. I went to my Bible concordance and went to that number for giants, got the number, went to the back to the Hebrew, because I'm in the Old Testament. That word giants does not mean, my friends, stature or height. That word giants is pointing to character. That word giant means a bully. That word giant means a tyrant. That word giant means a rebel. That word giant means one who is rebellious towards God. So these were God's people, the sons of God. They went to unite with giants, not in stature, but those who were rebels. Those who were rebellious towards God, my friends. And then they bore who? They had children. Then what would be the character traits of those children? Giants. Not literal giants, my friends, but the children also would become tyrants. Do you see, my friends? Rebels. Notice here on your sermon notes. Line number Line number four, uh, line number nine B, it says, my friend, the Bible says uh, that God's people married and what, my friends? They united with the giants, those who were tyrants, those who were rebels, those who were what, my friends? Rebellious towards God. Look at verse four again of Genesis chapter six, verse four. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto whom? The daughters of men, that they bear who, my friends, uh, children to them, the same, the children became what? Talk to me. Became mighty men, it says, which were of old men of what? Renown. What does the word renown mean? Talk to me. Renown. Famous, right? So these children in the days of Noah were renowned. They were famous for being mighty men. Don't miss that. God's professed children, the children in Noah's day, they were known, renowned, they were, and re means to repeat. <laughs> they were known over and over again to be mighty men. Friends, that word mighty doesn't mean strength, physically. That word mighty means also a tyrant. Notice your sermon notes here, my friends. As a matter of fact, look at line number 10 with me. What does the word mighty mean in the original Hebrew language? Answer what, my friends? A warrior and a what? And a tyrant. The children in Noah's day were known to be what? Tyrants. Rebels. Rebellious towards God. And parents are really asking, are we living in the last days? Look at your home, parents. For the majority of our children are tyrants. They are rebels toward God. They are stubborn, my friends. And in the Bible, listen to me carefully, in the Bible, I wonder who was known in that same time period to be a mighty one in the earth? A man called Nimrod. Look at Genesis chapter 10 with me. And beloved, this, this is not the condemned parents and to condemn children. The fact of the matter is, my friends, we're living in the days of Noah. It's being repeated. And if we come to our Seventh-day Adventist churches, what is the thing now being said? Our young people are leaving the truth. You're asking, are we living in the last days? Well, in Noah's day, those children were known to be mighty. That number in the Hebrews 1368, they were known to be mighty. Mighty how? They were known to be rebels of God. Just like Nimrod. And beloved, talk to me here. Talk to me here. Did Nimrod build a kingdom? What was that kingdom name that Nimrod built? Babel. And from, from Babel, which word do we get? 
Babylon, my friends. So those who are mighty today in the church are children who are rebels toward God, rebellious toward God. They are indeed building up Babylon. And did God throw down the Tower of Babel? So if our children and parents don't get their act together, my friends, as Babel was torn down and they were scattered, you'll be scattered by God and not be gathered in by God. Genesis chapter 10. Are we there, my friends? Look at verse 8 with me. And Cush. And friends, bear in mind, all I did was to approach the ark as if I've never heard this thing before. Our problem is we approach God's word with preconceived ideas. And our minds are locked to what God wants to show us. Friends, it's time to get right with God. Amen. Young people, it's time to become converted. The old things, it's time to kiss those things goodbye. It's time to be married with Jesus, young people. Amen. It's time. Verse 8, and Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a what? And he began to be a mighty one. Not mighty in strength, my friend. It's the same number, Hebrew 13, 68. It means he was a tyrant, a warrior. That means, my friends, he was warring against God. And Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, For the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to God's law, neither indeed can it be. And our children and parents, we are warriors. Not for God, but against God. Not for God, but in God's sight. He views us as being tyrants, rebels, mighty. Notice in verse 9. He was a what, my friend? He was a mighty hunter. Before whom? Bef that means in God's, God viewed Nimrod as a mighty one. And three times the word mighty is used. Verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the what, my friends? Uh, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And verse 10 says, and the beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. And in chapter 11, God scattered and tore down Babel, Babylon, my friends. Young people, listen up. It's time to stop asking, are we really living in the last day? Look at your life. Rebels. Go back to chapter 6 here, my friends, in Genesis. And once God saw this, notice what God said, my friends. Notice what God did, beginning now with verse 5 of Genesis chapter. My friend, God closed probation. And think about it. Why would God not close probation then? If these uh, parents began to adopt uh, the sinful lifestyle practices of the world and brought those things into their homes, into their churches, then how would the children live? Just like the world. And should those children who are now tyrants, now rebels, should those children grow up and have other children? How would those children live? What would be the traits of character in those children? Just like the parents, my friends. 99.9% .9 of the time, rebels, my friends. So it came to a point in which Jesus says, enough is enough. There's no more hope for society. I cannot allow this to linger any longer. Noah, build the ark. Build the ark. It tells me, my friends, since the, 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 the cliche nowadays within Seventh-day Adventism is uh, our children are leaving the truth which they are we living in. The last days, my friends. For should these children grow up and have children of their own, what would be the traits of character in these children? Mighty, giants, rebels, tyrant, stubborn towards God, my friends. Probation is what? Closing. Closing. You hear me, my friends? Closing. Verse 5 of Genesis chapter 6. Are we there, my friends? Bible puts it this way. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Who was these men here? 
the world or among his professed people? His professed people. Because the world is the world. Amen. Amen. Notice in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his where, my friends? His heart. Verse 13. And God said unto whom? Unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with where? The earth. Make thee a what, my friends? Make thee a what? So my friends, since the very same things that transpired in Noah's day are happening right now, what is it time to build, my friends? It's time to build what, my friends? It's time to build the ark. But not, but not just to know what the ark is, but we must get on board the ark. Because, friends, I believe it was not only Noah and his wife, uh, uh, three sons and, and three daughter-in-law that built that ark. Many others helped to, to build the ark, but did not get on board the ark, my friends. Could it mean we have young people? Who are occupying the church but aren't spiritual? Could it be, my friends, all of us come here and we are supporting Save to Serve Church. We are supporting Seventh Day Adventism, and yet we aren't spiritual. We're not getting on board the yard. Our presence bring other people to the church. They get on board the ark. While you are left outside of the ark. That's sad, my friends. It's sad. First Peter chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? Notice here, my friends, First Peter chapter 3. Let's take a look here at what God was waiting on in the days of Noah before he sent the flood. Where are we going to, my friends? 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 19 with me. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 says, are we there? Are we there, friends? Notice in verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God, the what, my friends? The long suffering of God waited in whose day? Waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. We're in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So what was God waiting on in the days of Noah before he sent the flood? What was he waiting on, my friends? Come, come on, give me the words of verse 20. What was he waiting on? Friends, huh? While the ark, he was waiting for the ark to be built. Go back to verse 20. Maybe you missed it, my friends. You missed it. Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the what? So my friends, what was God waiting on before he sent the flood? The ark. The ark to be built and to be occupied. So what is God waiting on, my friends, before he brings the closing scenes of earth's history? Huh? He's waiting for the spiritual ark to be built. Friends, not a literal ark. Because there would not be a literal flood to end this earth's history. It's a spiritual ark. Because there's coming a spiritual flood. We'll get there, my friends. But he's waiting on what, my friends? For the spiritual ark to be built, prepared. And for individuals to get on board the spiritual ark. What is that spiritual ark? Notice Hebrews chapter 11 with me, my friend. Are you building? Friends, are you building? And that's why I said earlier, where are your tools? Are you building? Huh? Are you building, my friends, the ark? Notice here in Hebrews chapter 11. Are we there, my friends? Beloved, we're in the closing scenes of earth's history. 
We don't need so much external signs to prove uh, we're in the last days. Those are good, but just look at the church and the homes. That's where it is, my friends, uh, the, 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 the clearest signs. So, beloved, it's either you are going to ask God to get you right before it's too late, or you're going to keep on believing that Christ will save you in your sins. Do you really believe he will save you in your sins? No. Huh? Do you really believe, my friends, that when that spiritual door of salvation is shut, you can enter in still? Beloved, it is shutting. It's time to know what the spiritual ark is, to ask God for strength to build it, and to stay on board that spiritual ark. Look at verse 7. Are we there, my friends? Are we there, my friends? Notice in verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared a what? Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So this ark is to bring about salvation. The ark is salvation, my friends. Not a spiritual boat or yacht. The ark is a spiritual house. Salvation, my friends. We must embody salvation. We must be in a saving relationship with Christ. That is the ark. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. amen. So now, parents, are you building the ark? Husbands, what ark are you building? Huh? The decisions you're making from day to day are those decisions, ones that will lead your family members, your wife and children to be saved. What ark are you building? And think God could have closed probation on you husbands long time ago. For the wages of sin is D-E-A-T-H, my friends. Death. But the long suffering of God is waiting until you get to your right senses. Saying, dear God, help me to prepare an ark to save my household. What ark are you building? Mothers. What ark are you building, wives? Huh? What ark are you building, my friends? It's time to build what? Oh, beloved, go back to Genesis chapter 6 with me. Where are we going back to, my friends? Genesis chapter 6. Young people, are you on board the ark? What ark are you building? Are you in a saving relationship with Jesus? How many more times do you need to hear this before you say, dear God, I'm outside of you. Help me to get on board the spiritual art before it's too late. Yeah. And friends, no, don't make any mistake about this. Since Christ has a spiritual art, the devil also has an ark. Yeah. Which ark are you on, my friends? Which ark? What must we be building, my friends? A what? An ark. So now follow me. What material was used to build that literal ark? Notice here in chapter 6 and verse 14. What, my friend, what would? Listen, it says in verse 14, Make thee an ark of what? Go for wood. Pause right there. This literal ark was made of what? Go for wood. And what did I do, my friends? Talk to me. I went to my Strong's Concordance. Because that word go for wood is only used once in the Bible. Right here, go for wood. So friends, I began to dig. Go for wood, the go for tree is really the fir tree. The what tree? Fir, F-I-R, the fir tree. So my friends, the literal ark was made out of fir tree. We today in these last days uh, must also make a spiritual ark out of spiritual fir trees, fir wood. So now come to question, what does fur represent in the Bible? Not F-U-R, as cats are furs. No, F-I-R, the fir tree. What does fur represent in the Bible, my friends? Fur, the fir tree, is a spiritual condition in which God's people are brought to a point in which they say, what more do I have to do with sin? From this day forward, I relinquish my sin. This is the fir tree experience. Are you building your ark, my friends? 
Go to Hosea chapter 14. Let's confirm that. Hosea chapter 14. Where are we going to, my friends? Hosea. Find the book of Daniel, Old Testament. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea chapter 14. Are we there, my friends? Notice in verse 8 of, of Hosea chapter 14. Verse 8 says, friends, are we there? Are we there, friends? Together. What it says here, friend? It says, Ephraim. Ephraim shall say what? Come on, talk to me. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green what tree? A green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. What's the fir tree experience, my friends? When Ephraim, who, who is Ephraim? A symbol of? Israel, God's people, when God's people say, what have I to do anymore with idols? They're having the fir tree experience. Beloved, what sin did you mingle with this past week? It's time to examine ourselves. What sin did you mingle yourself with and hold on to this week? And you knew those things were wrong. It shows then, my friends, you are not building a spiritual ark. If you are still holding on to known sins, my friends, without asking God for strength to relinquish those sins, it shows you are not on board the spiritual ark. In me is your fruit found. In whom? In Jesus but it was Christ who said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you shall bring forth what? Much fruit, my friends. You will bear fruit. The fir tree experience. The ark was made with what? Go for wood, go for wood, the fir tree. Israel shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? Let's pray right now, my friends. Let's pray. Beloved, because when we look at these things, we must pray the same prayer. Will you, my friends? Or will you sit here thinking, it's just one more sermon? It's just one more sermon. This must be our prayer. This must be our sincere prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, individually and collectively, as your people, sincerely we say, dear God, give us power to relinquish every idol. So that, dear God, we can truly be building our spiritual ark and that we can bear fruit to your glory. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone say what? Amen. Notice, my friends, Isaiah chapter 55. Where are we going to, my friends? Where are we going to, my friends? Isaiah chapter 55. The fir tree. Notice in Isaiah chapter 55. And what was used to make this ark, my friends? Go forward. Go forward. See a uh, cypress. And it moves on to fir tree. Notice in verse 12. Verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 55. Are we there? Skip on down to verse 13. Are we there, my friends? Notice the contrast with the fir tree. Verse 13. Are we there? Notice here it says, my friends... Instead of what? Talk to me. In, come on. Come on, friends. What, my friends? Instead of the thorn shall come up the what? The fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up what tree? Murder tree. Question, my friends. Where in the Bible is the first place we find thorns? Where? Where? In the Garden of Eden? In Genesis chapter 3. And what brought forth thorns? Did Christ create thorns? So what brought forth thorns? Sin. When man sinned, God said to Adam, because you have sinned, the earth shall bring forth thorns. Thorns and thistles. Thorns. A symbol of what? Sin, my friends. Why thorns? From the earth. Because the earth has been a symbol of man's heart. And mine. So because we are sin, my friends, as the earth is bringing forth thorns, so man's mind is sinful. Look at verse 13 again. So instead of the thorn shall come forth what? The fir tree. The contrast. Do you see, my friends? 
So since thorn is a symbol of sin, what is fir tree a symbol of? Righteousness, my friends. Do you see it? So what was used to make the ark? Huh. Oh, friends, righteousness. And what experience did Noah and those who were saved have? Noah being saved of, Noah being warned of God, warned of God. Of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. And he became heir of the what? Of the righteousness which is by faith, my friends. That's the ark, righteousness by faith. And beloved, it's not something that we argue about. It's an experience. The fir tree experience. That means when Christ sees us, there's no more thorns coming out of our hearts. And do thorns prick? We don't prick each other, my friends, and provoke each other to sin. Are you on board the ark, my friends? What is your influence leading others to do? Are you building a spiritual ark? Genesis chapter 6. Where are we going back to, my friends? Let's take a look at this ark one more time, my friends. Look at verse 14 with me of Genesis chapter 6. Are we there, my friends? Verse 14, are we there, my friends? I want to make sure. Are we there, my friends? Verse 14 says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Now watch verse 14. Notice, rooms shall thou make in the ark. What must be in the ark? Rooms shall thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with what? Pitch. Hold on there. What could this mean? Put rooms in the ark and put pitch on the inside and pitch on the outside. Guess what I did when I didn't understand what pitch meant? I went to my strong concordance. Take your sermon notes here. Look at line 21 with me. What does the phrase pitch it within and without mean in the original Hebrew language? Answer. To pitch means what, my friends? Uh, to cover, to make an atonement, uh, to cleanse, uh, to purge away. That's what pitch means, my friends. Pitch. And what was God waiting on before he brought the flood in Noah's day? The ark had to be built. And built how? Put pitch on the inside. Pitch on the outside. So what is God waiting on in these last days before he brings the end of this earth's history? What must be built? A spiritual ark. Must it be pitch on the inside and on the outside? Then what does pitch mean, my friends? To perch, to cleanse. Pitch where? Pitch on the inside and pitch on the outside. So where must we be cleansed and purged? Oh, beloved. What is God waiting on? Beloved, he's waiting for us to be purged on the inside in our thoughts. And to be purged without outside in our words and our actions. The long suffering of God, my friends, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. What is God waiting on? For his people to be cleansed 100%. And beloved, the beautiful truth is the gospel is Christ could have closed probation already. But the long suffering of God is still waiting, my friend. Do you know what shocked me? What was placed in the ark? Verse 14. The Bible says rooms. Friends, talk to me. What, my friends? Uh, rooms were placed in the ark. Beloved, and it was pitch where? Within and without. And what does pitch mean? The second word there. Pitch, come on, to cover and to what? To make an atonement. Beloved, I fell on my knees when I saw this in my study. The ark, Noah's ark had rooms. It was pitched on the inside and on the 
outside. Pitch means what to make an atonement. Does the heavenly sanctuary have rooms? What work is Christ doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary? He is making an atonement. So what's the comparison? Noah's ark was a type of the heavenly sanctuary. Let that settle in, friends. And how many were saved? That means in Noah's day, only eight accepted the sanctuary message. Only eight had an experience with the sanctuary. Only eight. I wonder how many will it be in these last days. Hmm. And Christ is now making what, my friends? He's making the atonement. We must be cleansed. I fell on my knees and I said, dear God, cleanse me. Within and cleanse me without. I opened my hymnal, my friends, and I began to sing the song, Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want you forever to live within my soul. Break down every barrier. What have I to do anymore with idols? Cast out every. What does every mean? Some? Every foe. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Lord, wash me and I shall be what? Beloved, do you understand the long suffering of God? Noah's Ark, a type of the sanctuary. Go back to Genesis chapter 6 here, my friends. God is waiting for us to be cleansed, safe to serve members, young and old. And think about this. Many of us have committed sins in what Jesus should have said, could have said, enough is enough. Ephraim is joined to her idols, joined to his idols. Leave him, leave her alone. He's God. He could have done that already, my friends. Because every sin crucifies him afresh. And just like us, many times when we are feeling pain, the primary thing on our mind is, is to stop the pain. And every sin we commit hurts Jesus. And he could have said, the only thing to stop this pain is to blot out those who are bringing pain to my heart. But my friends, the long suffering of God, as it waited, for the ark to be prepared, his long suffering is waiting now. Yes. But he says he won't wait forever, my friends. Are you building the ark? Step number one, my friends, are you wrapped with the fir tree experience? That's step number one. Are you covered with the fir tree experience? The next time you put on a coat or jacket, remember the fir tree. The next time you put on a blouse or a shirt, Remember, you must be covered with the fir tree. And what is the fir tree experience? Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? I relinquish all. He's waiting, my friends. It's not going away forever. And step number two, oh, beloved, what is it? We must be pitched on the inside and on the outside. Do you see the sequential order there? Once we say, what have I to do anymore with idols? It means we are being cleansed in the mind and cleansed in word and in action, my friends. He's waiting. He's waiting, my friends. Notice this. You haven't seen anything yet. Notice in chapter 6 here in verse 16. Skip on down to verse 16. Are we there, my friends? What was placed in the ark? Verse 16. It says, hey, a what? Talk to me. It says, my friends, a window shall thou make to the what? Ark. Pause right there. Beloved, hold your finger on Genesis chapter 6 and go with me to Genesis chapter 8. Because, beloved, all of us know that when the floods, when the rain ceased in Noah's day, Noah opened what? A window and allowed a raven and some birds to fly out, right? 
Beloved, when you go back to your strong concordance, the word for window are different in both places. That window in chapter 8, verse 6 of Genesis, he opened a window of the ark and let birds out in verse 7. That really means a literal window. But in chapter 6, that word that is at the root of window doesn't mean an opening like that. Doesn't mean that. Do you know what it means? Take your sermon notes. No, look at your sermon notes here, my friends, on line number, let's take a look here on line number 23. Are we there? It says, answer, what does the word window mean in the original Hebrew language? It means how many lights? Come on, friend, how many lights? It means dual light, double light. It means to glisten. It means to produce light. It means what? To anoint. It means what? Anointing oil. What was God waiting on before he brought the flood and now was the hate? For a specific window to be placed in the ark. Not a literal window, my friends, but one that would produce light or bring light in. Different window. And the word for this producing light, it means to anoint. It means the olive oil. Beloved, who in the Bible is likened unto oil? The Holy Spirit of God, my friends. So what is God waiting on in these last days to be placed in the spiritual ark? What must we receive, my friends? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. And notice it says double light. Does the Holy Spirit come in twofold manifestations? The early and the latter rain, my friends. So what is God waiting on to bring the spiritual flood? The closing crisis of this earth's history is waiting for its people to be anointed, my friends. Anointed. Anointed. It's a three-step process. Cover with fir tree. What have I to do anymore with idols? Number two, we are cleansed within and without. And then what do we receive from the Holy Spirit? Beloved, we then are anointed, my friends. What is God waiting on? So, beloved, is God going to anoint us in our sins? So, beloved, if you know that your loved one is waiting to come and receive you, but he's saying you must receive my anointing first, how then will you respond to him today? Will you not say, okay, dear God, whatever is separating me from you, here they are, take them away. To you, I surrender all. Notice here, my friends, on your sermon notes. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 6. Look with me, my friend, at verse 16. Are we there? Are we there, my friends? A window shalt thou make into that ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the where? The side thereof. I can't stop right there. With lower, second, and how many? So how many stories did this ark have? I wonder why three stories. But how many doors? One door. I wonder why one door. There's only one way to Christ, my friends. And in this ark, there are three levels, lower, second, and the third level. I wonder what they mean. Huh? Someone says the three angels messages and you are correct but friends I'm going to take you deeper than that as God brought me deeper take your sermon notes here notice on line number 26 B are we there line 26 B says I saw a company who stood well guarded and firm giving no countenance to those who would unsettle the established faith of the body God looked upon them with approbation I saw how many steps? I was shown three steps. What were they, friends? The first, the second, and what? The third angel's messages. Listen, friends. Said my accompanying angel, Woe to him who shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of what, my friends? 
Because if you don't enter the ark, you are lost. Listen now, the last line there from the book, Early Writings, page 258 says, The destiny of whom? Come on, friends. The destiny of souls, your destiny hangs upon what, my friends? The manner in which they are known, right? Known, right? No. The manner in which they are received. Why three stories? Why lower, second, and third? Beloved, guess where I went? My strong concordance. Because, friends, if we do not know what these steps are, how can we climb them? Beloved, the word lower means depth. The word lower means womb, a woman's womb. Lower means a woman's womb as it means to be born. Hear me carefully. But there was a second level. And that word second means double. That word second means again. So hold on. If the lower means to be born, and the second means again, what is God telling us? Oh, beloved. In order for us to get on board this ark and to remain on the ark, we must be born again. That's what God is teaching us, friends. We must be born again. And the Bible says, my friends, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are what? Passed away. What have I to do anymore with idols? Behold, all things are become new. Are you experiencing a born again experience, my friends? Think about it. Because if you are not experiencing the born again experience, do you really believe you're on board the ark? But beloved, my point is, God should have closed your probation a long time ago. Do you see God is loving and long-suffering? He's giving us multiple opportunities. Yes, we were born, but friends, we must be born again. And then come the third story, the third height. That word third means, my friends, it means the highest. I said, Lord, what could this mean? The highest, lower to be born. Second, again, born again. Third story. And the Lord said, Andrew, who does the door represent? Who does the door represent? The door represents Jesus, so that means uh, these three steps can be found where? In Jesus. And then the concordance says, that word third, line 29, that word third means a third part. What's the next phrase? A third day. I said, Lord, did Christ experience anything around three days? Where was he? His death, burial, and resurrection. Three days, right? He was three days in the earth. His death, burial, and what? So, beloved, listen carefully. If we do not experience uh, Christ's death, uh, Christ's burial, and Christ's resurrection, we will not be saved. That simply means the resurrection. Well, hold on. On which day did he rise on? On which day did Christ rise on, my friends? The third day the third story and to rise on the third day means what to rise to walk how to walk in the newness of life Romans chapter 6 my friends where are we going to beloved Christ has been waiting for us uh, to die to sin uh, to stay dead to sin you're not hearing this thing my friend Christ's death uh, to die to sin. His burial, did he rise on the second day? No. So when you surrender a sin, you keep the sin surrendered. Amen. You die to sin, remain dead to sin. Third day, third height, third story, you rise to walk how? In the newness of life, friends. Wonder. And yet you have many preachers and teachers and churches teaching some other experience. And say, this will cause you to be saved. That's another door. And guess what? It's not in God's ark. 
And those who are teaching such, they are robbers and thieves. Romans what chapter, my friends? Romans chapter 6. Are we there? Look at verse 3 with me. Are we there, my friends? Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 3 with me. How many steps, my friends? And what are they? You die to sin. What else? You stay dead to sin. What else? You rise to walk where? And beloved, was the ark a symbol of the sanctuary? Are there three apartments in the sanctuary? The whole sanctuary. There is the outer court. Then comes the holy place. Then comes the... How many steps do you have there? How many, low, how many stories on, in the ark? Three. The sanctuary, my friends. We are talking about justification by faith. Sanctification by faith and glorification by faith. Look at verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as are what, my friends? Are we there? As we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into what? His death, number one. Therefore, we are what now, friends? Buried with him by baptism into death. That's the second step. Then comes step number three together now. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so should who? Should we also, what my friends, walk in how? In the newness of life, my friends. How are we going to get on board the ark? We have to be buried with him in what? Baptism. Beloved, have you been baptized? And if God was to make the appeal right now, who wants to give their hearts to God in baptism? How many of you would say, dear God, you have waited so long for me to have this experience. Today, I choose to be baptized. How many of you would do that? Huh? Many of you would still sit there delaying what you know it's right to do. It's time to surrender, my friends. And some of us need to be re-baptized, my friends. That second step, you are born, but you must be what? Born again, my friends. And rise to walk out in the newness of life, my friends. It's only one door to Jesus. Go back, my friends, to Genesis chapter 6. One door. And beloved, what was one of the last things that Christ did before? The flood came. Ah, huh? the door was what? Shut. So beloved, pause right there. Is God's long suffering going to wait forever for you to surrender? No. Beloved, why would you allow the devil to, to deceive you to think such? Will Christ's long suffering last forever? So when must we surrender, my friends? When must we give our hearts to him? When must we be covered with the fir tree? When must we say it from today, I want to have nothing more to do with sin? When, my friends? When must we say, dear God, cleanse me within, cleanse me without? When must we have a window to bring light into our soul? Hmm? To be anointed with the holy anointing. When, my friends? And the Bible says your eyes is the what? The light of the body. What are you watching, friends? What are you watching? For by beholding, you become changed. Changed. What are you beholding, my friends? It is time, my friends, to die to sin and what? Remain dead to sin and to rise to do what, my friends? To walk how? To walk how, my friends? In the newness of life. Friends, the door is shutting. And once that door shut, where were Noah and his family? Uh, where were they, my friends? Beloved, is a flood coming? Let me wipe my bow here, my forehead. Beloved, my forehead? Go with me to Genesis chapter 6. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, is there a flood coming? No, not, not, not a literal flood, my friends. And before that flood comes, where should family members be found? Inside the ark, 
And if we want to be specific, they must be experiencing the sanctuary experience. Three steps. Do you see it? Lower, second, and what? To walk in the newness of life. Friends, this is the essence of the three angels' messages. Does the world need this, my friends? But what are we doing as seven-day Adventists? We are putting down the banner and we are mingling with Nimrod. We're ni we are mingling with the Babylonians, my friends. We are trying to enter through another door. And friends, some of us are uneasy when I just said that. But friends, it's the truth. If somebody is dying of cancer, would you hold it back or would you tell him or her? I would give the diagnosis so the person can find a remedy. Amen. Our church is dying, my friends, spiritually. I don't care about numbers. Our churches are dying, my friends. And the, and the, the, the watchmen are like dumb dogs, not barking, my friends. And beloved, one day that door is going to be shut. And souls, my friends, are going to be knocking, 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 knocking. And it's going to be too late. And not just those in the world. But many like the five foolish virgins. They had lambs but had no oil. They knew about the ark but didn't have this window. This window, the anointing oil. So friends, again, we must our family members be found before the flood comes. And what are we studying here, my friends? The ark of what? Notice here in verse, in verse chapter 6. Notice with me right here, beginning with verse, where am I? Notice in verse 18, are we there? Yes. Together. But with thee will I establish my what? Ah, oh, beloved, do you see it now? What kind of a relationship did Noah and his family have with Jesus before the flood came? They were in what? They were in a covenant relationship with Jesus. What are we studying here? Amen. The ark of what? Do you see why the word ark has the root word of Noah's ark? Because those who got on board Noah's ark had a, had a covenant relationship with God. Amen. Who shall be saved in these last days? Those who are in a covenant with Jesus but oh let me be more specific verse 18 listen because friends this is an individual experience verse 18 but with thee I'm closing but with thee will I establish my what covenant and thou shall come into where the ark ark of the covenant you and your what sons and th and there and thy wife and thy sons are why is with thee? Do you see why it's the devil's plan to bring two individuals together? Yes. Huh? If one is trying to live for God, but the other one is an unbeliever, to pull them both down. This must be an individual experience. Hebrews chapter 10. Where are we going to, my friends? This must be an individual experience. Only those who are in a covenant with Jesus are getting on board this ark, my friends. And beloved, it's like standing at some station, some transportation station, about 5 or 10 or 25 minutes before that transportation leaves. There is an announcement which says, all on board. All on board. And beloved, follow me carefully. While that might be a declaration, I believe it can also be a question. Are all on board? Are all on board? And the only way to answer in the affirmative, if we are on board, is Jesus on board? Is Christ's words on board the ark of your mind? Because, friends, if you don't love what he loves and hates what he hates, you are not on board the ark, my friend. And this ark is leaving. 
<laughs> and when that door shuts, you can't get in, my friend. I don't care who you are, you can't get in. And when that thing takes off, you can't, you, 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 you go back home. <laughs> and beloved, with tears in my eyes, some of us are going to be left behind. Because we stood there, the door was open, and we began to become so caught up in external things that we allowed the door to shut and the thing to take off. And we were left outside. Friends, what's distracting you today? Verse 16, are we there, my friend? Let's close. Are we there? This is the what? This is a covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, what will we do, my friends? I will put my friends as Jesus on board your ark in your mind. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more, my friends. The atonement is made, is completed, my friends. The door is about to shut. Beloved, what just passed Congress recently, my friends? I mean, what did the Supreme Court just voted? Beloved, is a flood coming? Notice what this says, my friends. Look at line number 30 C. It says, as the what, as the what? Come on, friends, as the what approaches? As a storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the what message? In the third angel's message, they understand this, what we're talking about. But have not been what? Sanctified through obedience to God's truth. What will they do? Abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with Nimrod. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the what, my friends? When the flood, when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the what? The easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. And when who, my friends? When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts. To answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them is the mark of the beast around the corner, my friends. Yes. Beloved, notice what this says. I can't even go through this. It says what? Nation, Nation has what? Yes. Turned against God. We have just said it's okay. Let the states decide if gays can get married. My friends, the false marriage is here. The false day of worship is here. Turn what, my friends? Turn nation to God. I wonder how they will do this. When a nation turns its back on God, they have passed the false marriage. It says, my friend, it's what? It's time for what, my friends? And guess how they say we can do it, my friends? They say, first, through prayer. Next, doing what? Reading the Bible and going to church. In the article, it says it's time to even force people to go to church on Sunday. Is the mark of the beast here, my friends? Beloved, is it time to get on board the ark? Oh, beloved, is it time to get on board the ark? Has God been waiting, my friends? So when do you plan to surrender? Hmm? When do you plan to give your heart to God? When does he want you to surrender? So beloved, if he wants you to surrender right now, why will you delay giving your heart fully to God? Who wants to give their heart to God right now? Huh? I see hands. Friends, every hand should raise 
should rise in this church. Who wants to give the odds to God? I want to raise your hand for God, my friends. Who? Hands down, hands down, hands down. Beloved, this might be your last message you will ever hear. Last message. If God spoke to your heart and you want to be baptized, why not raise your hand for Jesus? If God spoke to your heart and you want to be baptized, why not raise your hand for Jesus? Right now, my friends, and, 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 and don't be afraid. His hands were raised for you. Keep your hands raised. Do you feel that there's power in prayer? Yes. All right. I want to slip out your seat and come. Just slip out your seat and come. I want to pray with you. Come on. Come on. I want to pray with you.